Hey everybody, thanks for uh, coming to my talk, Monolithic Accounts Considered Harmful. Why is everybody looking at me like that? Do you think I'm being a little dramatic when I suggest that an oversized AWS account is equivalent to a large, ominous stone monolith overlooking a burning village? Well, I'm here to convince you that, in fact, monolithic accounts represent a really big risk to the organizations that run them, and that it, in fact, holds hostage many of the benefits that we derive from adopting cloud in the first place. I mean, just think about what a monolith represents. Thousands of resources, hundreds, potentially thousands of user accounts in IAM. How can you possibly understand an account of that size? How can you reason about it? How can you ensure its security and its manageability? Don't you lose some of the flexibility that you gain from adopting cloud in the first place? Practically speaking, what does a monolith actually look like? Well, you might end up with dozens of VPCs in one region, in multiple regions, with a hodgepodge of, uh, of peering connections among them and no centralized or designed network architecture. Security groups with dozens of rules from site ranges that you don't even recognize, but you're kind of too afraid to remove in case something important is allowed and you don't want to break it. Not to mention IAM rules, IAM policies, these things are complex enough to start with, right? But imagine over years of uh, changes and updates how complex they can get. Can you really guarantee that you know exactly what a user has access to? How would you know that they don't have access to some shared accounts or some service accounts? Probably you can assume if there, if there are hundreds of IAM users in your account, probably most of them could gain administrative access if they wanted to. And of course, there's that one developer in that one group that you kind of forgot about and he started using the one service you didn't want him to in that region that you didn't want to use. Let's not even get started talking about the billing statement, which in an account of this size is probably pretty scary. Most of us that have seen really large billing statements know that it's really difficult to actually sort through and identify what the costs are uh, when they get to this size. Maybe we're using something like Cloud Health, one of the vendors who's here today, um, to help sort through using something like tags, right? We can use tags to decide um, what expenses are being incurred and who they should be attributed to. Um, but how do you enforce a tagging policy across an account of this size? So kind of in summary there, the point is, so those of us who are administrators, security professionals, architects, um, this is a real quandary for us. We need to uh, avoid getting into this scenario. But I'm happy to share with you today that there is an answer, and the answer is the multi-account security strategy. So, you know, step aside serverless, step aside AI, the multi-account strategy is really the new hotness, and it's kind of the thing that I think you should be paying attention to. At the center of the multi-account strategy is AWS Organizations. Um, AWS Organizations was released by AWS as a, a result of watching their customers struggle with this very problem. And I think people, uh, businesses arrived at kind of two approaches. Either they, they had the monolith that had these problems of um, complexity and growth in a single account and they needed to figure out how to break it apart, or they're a large business and all the different groups arrived at the cloud at different times um, and each one of them had their own AWS account and they needed a way to manage that more effectively. So AWS watched this happen. They released AWS organizations as a, a way to combat it, along with a bunch of related features. So at its essence, at its core, AWS organizations is a, an interface to manage accounts. There's a console experience. There's an API to do things like creating accounts, attaching policies to those accounts, organizing those accounts into an OU structure, and kind of managing multiple accounts. One of the things that organizations unlocks for us is the SSO experience, where you can uh, connect login capabilities for your AWS accounts to an identity provider like OneLogin or Okta or even to an Active Directory. And for a security professional, this is really a dream come true because now I can use a provisioning and deprovisioning process for AWS can be the same as it is for all of my other apps. I can control permissions and authorizations and roles that way. Um, so that's been a, a really a big win. You can also enforce security baselines. So using what they call service control policies, I can uh, create a sub-account uh, under a master payer account in an AWS organization, and I can restrict and filter what types of AWS 
APIs are available. So I could say, for example, um, this account can only run EC2 API calls, and I could prevent them from running everything else. So as a security administrator, I can feel really confident that I can create a member account within my organization and hand over root privileges to another group or another uh, team or department or a person, and I can feel confident that they can do what they need to get done. I'm not getting in their way, but at the same time, uh, I can feel uh, safe, and I know that some of the policies that I needed uh, to be approved are going to be enforced and they can't be circumvented. We also gain per account cost attribution. So when you receive your billing statement at the end of the month, you see account number and you see the cost associated with that account. So no longer do I need to uh, sort through some complex arrangement of tags uh, to understand the bill. Instead, I can just look at this consolidated bill and see, well, I know this department runs this account and therefore this is the price that they need to pay. And last but not least, compartmentalization. This is an important security concept where we're limiting the scope of a successful attack so that in the event of a breach of one account or of one service, I can be reasonably confident that it's not going to go outside the boundaries of that account, with some exceptions, of course, if you're leaving credentials lying around in plain text or uh, you have a poorly designed network architecture, maybe this isn't going to help you, but compartmentalization is one of the key benefits that we gain from using multiple accounts. So enough with kind of the theory and the, the reasons behind it, let's look at some of the practical sides. This is uh, one implementation of the multi-account strategy called the identity account strategy. And disclaimer, this is lifted, not quite verbatim, it's got my own twist on it, but it's, uh, this is well documented in Amazon's documentation, so take a look at it for more details. Um, so let's, let's, yeah, let's just look at the details on this one. Four different accounts here. The identity account uh, at the top in purple. Its only purpose is to authenticate users. It doesn't run any uh, actual resources. There's no service here. It's only an authentication endpoint. Three other accounts. We have development and production. Development would be where you'd host any environments uh, that are not for production customers, right? Things like staging and QA and test and dev. All those networks could live here in this development account. Production is, does what it says on the tin. It's for serving real live customers. And then we have our command and control account. This is an account that has uh, networks in it that can be attached into the other accounts and the other networks, and you can use it for management purposes. Maybe this is where you put your observability tools, your CI infrastructure, if you have uh, SecOps tooling, anything that, maybe a bastion host, anything that needs to talk into these others. So the user experience is that you um, you land at your identity provider's login portal, at the Okta login portal. This is, um, this is my setup, is Okta and Duo. So you land at the login portal, you provide your credentials to log in. The second step, of course, very important, is to have MFA. I really trust Duo security with our MFA. So it's an outside provider from Okta. And if they pass that step, then they're presented with a list of roles that they can assume. They assume a role and they land in that identity account. At this point, they can't do much, right? They don't have any permissions in the identity account. The, the goal of the identity account is not to actually run services, but they can perform what's called role chaining to assume a second role into one of these other accounts where they really need to, to go to do their work. So kind of a multi-step process there. It's um, a little bit of a burden, but the security benefits that we gain from it are really strong. And I think Amazon would even agree that this is a really nice secure design. So what does it look like from a, a little more technical standpoint to onboard one of these new accounts? Well, we can rely on the AWS organization's API methods for a bunch of this. The most important one here at the top, create account. This is an asynchronous call that takes just two parameters, an account name, this is a friendly name for us to identify the account by, and then an email address that needs to be unique among all AWS accounts, right? This is for the root user, the root controller of this new account. Since it's uh, an asynchronous call, we need to be aware of when it's done being created so we can start using it and we can use the describe create account status API call for that purpose. Once the account is done being created, then we can assume role into a, a role that gets automatically created as part of that create account call. So this organization account access role gets created, we can assume it and now we can start setting up and initializing our new account. The first thing I like to do with a new account is to run a series of CloudFormation templates that set the account up in a way that is compliant with my policies. So this might include things like creating more IAM roles for the users to assume, setting up some of those trusted advisor steps, like maybe a password policy, that kind of thing, 
configuring CloudTrail or GuardDuty or many of the other great observability tools that have been mentioned in some of the earlier talks today. Um, and making, putting all this into CloudFormation makes it just something you can stamp out really easily. I always like to secure the root account. So there is that unique email address and you need to set a strong password on it. I always set up MFA on a root account and uh, to, there's kind of a best practice that I've found or it, you, you might find that your preferences vary, but you don't want to tie the root account to a single MFA device, right? Because then what happens if that individual leaves the organization or lose their device, you might lose that root account access. So in fact, when you onboard MFA in AWS, you, if, as you may recall, you scan a little QR code, right? And, and put the, um, the MFA into your authenticator app. You can actually, there's like a manual string that you can grab and that's good enough for initializing MFA. So what I like to do is grab that manual string and put it into a password vault that's shared among a very trusted small group of uh, administrators. And this way, anybody that needs to kind of break the glass, so to speak, to get into that root account can look in the password vault, get the root account credentials, set up MFA on their device, and they're good to go. And then that last step there is pretty obvious, add alternate contacts. By default, the, the root, the member, um, the Contacts there are for the master account, the master pair, and maybe you want the account owner, the new account owner to have access to it. So set them up as contacts, and then you're kind of done. Now this is dramatically simplified process from setting up a standalone, a traditional standalone AWS account, where you have to validate a phone number and set up a payment method and choose a support plan and accept the customer um, acceptable use policy. All of these steps are kind of sidestepped, and instead you just have an almost completely automatable process. Not all the way, but uh, close enough to where the onboarding process is a lot simpler. We also unlock some really interesting network architecture possibilities. And so here's one that I'd like to share with you. We, we have the same account structure that I mentioned before. A command and control account, a development account in production. In command and control, we set up a management network and we're gonna operate out of two regions out of US West 2 in Oregon and EU West 1 in Ireland. So we set up management, this is where we would install our Bastion server, our CI CD servers and stuff. In the development account, we have our dev and staging networks also present in both of these regions and then of course the same in production. We set up peering connections between uh, equivalent environments, right? So dev in US West 2 can talk to all the services in dev in, US West, in EU West 1. We set up all the routing to make that possible, same goes for staging and prod. And then from management, we set up peering connections to each one of these other networks. So this way, management can reach into dev, management can um, manage staging and production, uh, but they can't talk to each other because as you may recall, in a VPC peering connection, there's no transitive access, right? Dev can't talk to staging, dev can't talk to prod. So what we've set up here is a, a one-way trust relationship with centralized control. And this is kind of the theme here. It's the same that goes for the identity account. If you kind of think about it, the identity account doesn't trust the other accounts, but the other ac accounts trust the identity account by giving them roles that can be assumed. I've also been really deliberate with my IP range choices here. So if there's a master pair account with a bunch of member organizations, I can, um, as I set up new accounts for individuals and teams, I can give them some ideas of what IP ranges they should be using so that they don't overlap with the IP ranges in other accounts and this way peering works really nicely. So I've configured this for um, the developers on my teams and it's worked really well and I found a few tips and tools that have uh, made the process a little more palatable for people. So I'm gonna talk through these. Uh, the first one is a few, a couple of add-ons for Firefox, the multi-account container. I know that's a word you haven't heard in a while. Trust me, it's worth trying out again. Uh, the multi-account create container uh, plugin and the AWS extend switch roles plugin. So the first one lets you open up a Firefox window with multiple tabs in it, all of them signed in to different AWS accounts at the same time. And as far as I know, that's not possible with any other browser. There's no plugin for doing this in Chrome or in Safari. It makes for a really nice experience rather than having, like in Chrome, you need to set up multiple profiles for each account. That's kind of untenable when you start to get to a large number of accounts. Um, as a consultant, I remember encountering organizations that had dozens of accounts, potentially up to 100 different accounts. And so that's not gonna go well if you need a browser uh, window open for each one of them. If you've ever used uh, the assume role feature in AWS, you also know that switching roles 
can be a little tedious, and as soon as you get past five rolls, the little drop-down menu selector, it stops working and it rotates over itself. So what you really need is kind of infinite number of rolls to switch between, and that's what this other add-on provides. So highly recommend these two add-ons for Firefox if you're using multiple accounts. The next tool is SAML to AWS. This is a command line tool for obtaining temporary account credentials from a, a SAML identity provider. So it's great, it works with Okta and OneLogin, it works with DuoSec. Uh, I'm gonna give you a demo of how that works here in just a minute. It does have one limitation in that the role chaining, you know, like I said, you, you get your credentials in that first account and then you need to assume role again, it doesn't support that. So I've added on my own version of it that I have internally um, at Countable, the company uh, where I'm employed, and now I'm able to make a really seamless uh, request to get temporary API credentials and not have any of these IAM static API credentials laying around. I always, I feel like every talk I do anymore I'm mentioning Stacker. Stacker is a Python tool for managing and interfacing with CloudFormation. In my opinion, it's the best infrastructure as code tool out there. It relies on the really excellent Troposphere library for uh, generating CloudFormation templates and um, I just want to thank and appreciate Mark Peake, who is the author of Troposphere that made this possible. Mark happens to be with us here today. Uh, Mark, can you stand up and can we give Mark a round of applause? <laughs> this is long overdue. Mark has done really excellent work here and has been a super valuable member of the community. Um, I appreciate his work a lot. So I highly recommend Stacker as a way to programmatically write all of your, um, your AWS resources in Python, right? So you define your resources in Python, you run Stacker, it interfaces with CloudFormation to create the stack and update the stack and delete stacks for you. It has support for change control sets so you can feel really confident that when you run a command you know what's going to change. Um, it's the best way to manage AWS and when I mentioned before that I onboard a new account by setting up CloudFormation templates to initialize everything, I've actually defined it all in Python, so I just need to run Stacker and I can just stamp out these accounts whenever I need to. The next one is around Lambda functions for CloudWatch logs. So I'm not sure if anybody has used the CloudWatch logs interface, but let's just say it's less than ideal. If you've used something like Logly or Sumo Logic or Splunk, you know how valuable centralized log collection and B can be, and you also can understand the limitations of CloudWatch logs. So I like to get my logs out of CloudWatch as fast as possible into some centralized tooling. And if you have lots of accounts out there, that can be kind of tricky to do. So what I have is a series of two Lambda functions. The first one just watches for new CloudWatch log streams to be created. And when, they're, when they are created, it sets up what's called a subscription filter so that anytime a new log message is written to one of those streams, it centralizes them to Sumo Logic, which is my provider of choice. So now um, I automatically get centralized logging with every new account. That's a super great feature. Building and sharing AMIs centrally, this is a pattern that I think many of you might be familiar with. Um, of course, most of us probably rely on HashiCorp's Packer for building AMIs. It's clearly in, uh, far and away the best tool in, the, uh, in this category. So I use the command and control account to build my AMIs and then I automatically share it with the other accounts. And this way I have this kind of golden base image that I can use for uh, across all of the different accounts. Works really well. And then kind of the same story for CloudWatch metrics. Um, I want to have Grafana or perhaps the tick stack if you, if you prefer that, maybe you like Chronograph I think is their GUI tool. Um, I want to have a central monitoring observability dashboard that can reach into all these different accounts. So what I do is create a role that Grafana can assume in each account and I set up a data source for each one of these roles and now I have a single pane of glass for monitoring my entire AWS account infrastructure. So I want to give you just a brief demo of a couple of these tools um, so you can see what the, what the user experience looks like. Let's see how well this goes. Live demo, always risky. So the first thing I have Firefox open here and I have, this is the multi-container um, add-on. So I have management, non-prod, and prod. And I'm gonna go ahead and pick prod. So now I have this container open it's a little washed out on the screen, but these tabs are in fact color coded, so I, I can identify which one I'm in. And I'm gonna sign in, oh no, this is what I was worried about. Let's see, we need to get Wi-Fi probably. Okay, we're connected, let's try it again. Oh, 
Hooray. Okay, so now I'm gonna sign in to Okta. Of course, I'm using one password, which I consider to be the best password management tool. So I've gotten past my credential sign-in step, and now I'm going to be prompted for Duo, except the Wi-Fi is really slow. Any minute now. Send me a push. So this is gonna actually prompt me for a push notification on my watch, which I approve. Right, the whole the goal of this for me is to set up the most seamless experience for my developers because nobody wants extra steps. So a nice push notification to my Apple Watch um, makes that really easy. And now we're gonna get signed in. Geez, I might switch over to my hotspot at this point. Okay, so I have my list of apps. Um, I clicked on Amazon, and now I'm gonna be presented with that list of roles that I can assume. Everybody close your laptops. <laughs> yeah, so here I've got roles. I can be an admin or read-only in each one of these sub-accounts. I'm gonna go ahead and pick non-prod read-only access. And then I'm gonna twiddle my thumbs for 14 minutes or so. Exercising patience. Okay, it finally loaded. So at this point, I've landed into the identity account. Now, if I tried to click on any of the AWS services, I wouldn't actually have access to them, right? Remember, nothing is meant to be done here, but I have to report, perform that role chaining step. So now I need to switch role into the non prod account. Here's where we see that extend roles feature. I can pick non prod read only. The only permission that this role has is to assume role into the other account. And at this point, now I'm, I'm in the non-prod account and I can start using it. So that's the browser console-based experience. What about the CLI experience? I'm gonna switch over to a terminal. Um, and so I'm gonna run SAML to AWS. And I'm gonna log in. I'm gonna specify my default, oops, pro, default profile. This prompt you don't normally need to fill out, but I've been experimenting. Normally you can, uh, this is just already done. Okay, so I need to provide my Okta credentials, just like uh, in the browser window. Here's my password. It's gonna prompt me for Duo. I'm gonna ask for a push notification. I'm waiting for it on my watch to show up. I approve it. And now I'm getting logged in. I'm gonna be presented with my list of roles, just like in the browser. I pick non-prod read only. Great, so what this does is set up, if you can remember back to Terry's talk earlier, this sets up the .aws credentials file, right? So the credentials, the temporary credentials just obtained are put in that credentials file, but I'm still in that, um, that, non, that identity account. I haven't gotten to the account I need to do because SAML to AWS doesn't support role chaining. So at this point, I would need to do a second command line call for, uh, to get credentials in that other account. And that, that to me felt a little burdensome. Like, I don't wanna have to go through all these steps every time I need API credentials. So what I did was uh, extend SAML to AWS to support role chaining, and then I just mapped it to a function on my MacBook Pro touch bar, which is the only purpose I've found for the touch bar so far. And um, so there's a couple other parameters here. I'm gonna switch from the admin user to the read-only user, and I've defaulted to push notification, and I wrap the whole thing in an eval statement. This is a bash statement that will, so the SAML to AWS prints out uh, the credentials as environment variables that are exported, and by evaling them, I get those environment variables right into my current shell environment without any interaction on my part. Well, normally, like I said, normally this I won't need. Um, but basically, I can push my touch bar script it prints this out on the command line. I get a push notification on my watch. And now I'm good to go. Like as soon as it returns, I have credentials. And if I run something like AWS STS get caller identity, 
you could see that I, in fact, have, this is my non-prod account. So now I have credentials with a single command um, that will let me function in that account. And then I can just mo modify the parameters to get into any one of these accounts. And I've found that the developers on my team really love this because it's so seamless for them to use. Okay, so where were we? That's the demo. Um, yeah, of course, no solution is perfect. There's some challenges here. You remember the burning village part that I talked about at the beginning? Well, that's not exactly solved here. Like, having a lot of accounts with a lot of infrastructure is not better than having one account with a lot of infrastructure in it. So you still have some complexities around account sprawl and, uh, and uh, resource sprawl within these accounts. But I do think overall it's better because now I kind of have an, uh, an owner of each one of these accounts. I know who is in charge of it and I can give them some policies and controls to manage those accounts. The next one is kind of a networking pet peeve of mine. If you can also remember back to Terry's talk, when you set up a security group rule, there are two ways that you can identify the source. One is by CIDR range, you can allow an entire network in, and one is by a source security group. And that means that any service in AWS that's in that security group will be allowed in. That works great within a region or even uh, between accounts within a region, but it doesn't work cross account. Or, sorry, cross region. So if one region needs to allow security groups from another region, you in fact have to open up entire CIDR ranges, which violates the principle of least privilege, an important security concept where we don't want to give something more permission than it needs. So um, I'm confident that Amazon will address this. We also need to be really careful to avoid IP range clashes when there's a lot of owners of different accounts, there's a potential for them to choose the same IP ranges, and then they wouldn't be able to peer their networks if they need to. So having some controls around that is important. Those service control policies I mentioned before, um, these are, they follow almost exactly the IAM syntax, where I can say this account can run only EC2, or this account can run everything except EC2. But it doesn't support all the features of IAM. For example, it doesn't support conditions. So in IAM, you can say something like, um, this tag is required, or you can do this operation in this region, because that's a condition but you can't actually do that in service control policies. So there's some limitations around it. Another one that I'm confident Amazon will address is they, they tend to release things and improve them over time. Number five on the list is probably my personal biggest pet peeve, and that's this one hour expiration. So when you perform an assume role with SAML to your identity provider, that's configurable, uh, the duration of that session, from I think 15 minutes to 12 hours. 12 hours to me seems like a pretty reasonable balance between usability and the security of those credentials. But that actually doesn't work when you do the, assault, the, um, the role chaining. When you go and obtain that the second set of credentials, uh, that's only valid for an hour and that's hard coded. And for me, that means every hour, I need to go and repeat my SAML to AWS command. If I have some long running job that's taking longer than an hour, my credentials will expire in that amount of time and my script will kind of stop working. So I view this as a major drawback. Um, hopefully that will get addressed as well. And then the last one here, maybe quite not, not quite as relevant today because this whole idea is catching momentum, but for a long time, many tools out there didn't support the multi-account feature. Um, but as long as the tools that you like to use use the AWS SDK, then you'll probably be in good shape because it's, it supports the environment variables and it supports the AWS credentials file. So that's all I had to say about that. Thanks for listening. Um, enjoy the day.